It is the price of economic development. The fastest growing economies on Earth presenting the greatest dangers to our environment. Across Asia, polluted and disappearing rivers. In China, India, changing skylines and unbreathable air, vanishing ecosystems. But pitted against all this, some remarkable people trying to make a difference. This is their story. Making a difference. Some are optimistic. Good forest. Nice forest. That people will come and see the city and see a real forest in 50 years. I guarantee. <laughs> Some have proven success on the grassroots level. I am like the older aunt who helps coordinate things. At first we emphasize education. Now it's participation that's the important thing. Ordinary citizens, government, even the kids in kindergarten. Some are invested heavily in the technology of the future. Solar manufacturing costs will continue to drop down. We'll be very soon lower than the electricity generated by coal, gas, and oil. Others are determined despite the odds. The pain and suffering which I have when I look at the river and when I go to her, I know that this could be helped, this situation can be solved. Still others can point only to failure. A one-person effort cannot work. I keep reporting the water is bad. The factories keep saying it is good. What can a poor fisherman's wife do? What they all have in common is a belief, a belief that without people like them, this earth has little chance of survival. Rivers, the lifelines of Asia's civilization. 50,000 of them in India and China, many endangered. Explorer and geographer Wang Haoman has spent a lifetime studying the rivers and the roof of the world, which provides many of them a common source. Well, if you look at the, this China map, almost one quarter area is the Tibetan Plateau, and all the glacier snow fields are within this one quarter of it. And from this plateau, starts many of Asia's greatest rivers, be it the Yangtze that comes out here, the Yellow River, and then the Mekong, the Salwin, the Irrawaddy, the Ganges, Brahmaputra. So this is like the, not only the backyard of China, but the backyard of the rest of Asia. If you're just talking of the Yangtze, you're talking of about 200 to 300 million people that lives in this drainage area, let alone like the Mekong, which is international river that cuts through six countries. So, so certainly, this is not only the concern of China, it should be the concern of the rest of Asia and the world. China's State Environmental Protection Agency says there is nothing more important than saving the rivers. There are nearly 300 million people in rural areas who don't have clean water to drink. That may be a rough estimate, but it shows the scope of the problem. A large number of people in remote areas do not have access to clean water, and that is why water and water safety is our number one priority. But Chinese officials admit the government has not dedicated the resources to clean up the rivers. To a large degree, they have left it to individuals and something new in China, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, people making a difference. 
水告诉我一杯，唱。寒江水告诉我你怎样流过。On the key side of the Han River, they are in full song, led by a woman who has everything to sing about. They call her Auntie Yun, Yun Jan Li. She has hustled and bustled together a vibrant environmental non-governmental organization called the Green Han River. By any standards, it's achieving results. With her band of red-coated volunteers in central China's Hanan province, she's brought about major improvements in the heavily polluted Han River and its tributaries. She's led a campaign to monitor local water and advocate a cleanup. This day marks an especially important one in her mission: the arrival of a river boat to help carry out her work on the Han. Thanks to a donation from an American NGO. The Han is one of China's four big rivers, along with the Yellow, the Yangtze, and the Huai. In order to protect the river, a lot of small factories that were polluting have been closed down. Some bigger ones have installed wastewater treatment facilities. With her new boat, Yun can now take her campaign onto the waters itself. This a party of local school children receiving the green message. While Yun preaches from the front, the crew has to play cat and mouse with hidden mud banks. And when the boat hits mud, the engines are revved up, and the human ballast is shifted to free the boat again. This is barefoot environmentalism, but it's effective. A younger generation learning not to treat the river the way their parents did. All lessons that hopefully have been learned for life. They've left their mark at least on classmates Shu Yuke and Wei Jingyi. If I see garbage in the Han River, I should pick it up. If I can't reach it, I should use a stick. Anti Yun began her work in 2002. Alarmed by the pollution levels in the Han and the other rivers that feed into it, she set about tracking down and dealing with the polluters. The water of White River, which runs into the Han, was at one time completely black. It smelled really bad. It's a lot better now. This trip continues through the countryside that seems productive enough, with fields full of rapeseed and wheat. But what the villagers want to grow is rice, which the water from the river is still too polluted to support. Because of the pollution, we have not been able to grow rice here for many years. With our efforts and local government action, the river is getting cleaner. So I hope we can grow rice again in a few years. If the water isn't fit for agriculture, it certainly isn't fit for people. The village of Jiayuan knows the consequences of drinking from the river. They have worked hard to overcome health dangers. A modern well and water treatment plant constructed here count among Anti Yun's proudest achievements. We didn't know the cause of the illnesses, but there were a lot of people getting sick. But since we have been using water from the well, we have had only a few cases in the past two years. This water we know is good. Down by the river itself, the water is still far from clean. Village head Jai Jin Han scoops up some of the scum that still collects here from industrial waste deposits upstream. It's waste pulp from paper production. Still, it's far better than it used to be, as this picture taken just two years ago at the same spot shows. Slowly but surely, Anti Yun is making a difference. Her upbeat and charismatic campaign has carried her far. At ease with the media, she's won them over onto her side. Now, with a loyal following of some 2,000 volunteers, she seems to pick up more workers wherever she goes. When the volunteers come to us, we are like a big family. I am like the older aunt who helps coordinate things. At first, we emphasize education. Now, it's participation that's the important thing. Ordinary citizens, government, 
even the kids in kindergarten. She is also very skillful at playing the political game. Having formerly worked in public administration and local government, she knows just how the system works and just how far she can go. There are things that NGOs do better than government, and we can make the government realize our value and work with officials in their campaigns. The last stop on this trip is to celebrate another success, thanks in part to a donation from the Japanese government. This is a symbol of friendship between China and Japan. It will improve people's lives here. In the village of Liuan, the water is about to be turned on for the first time at their soon-to-be-completed well and water pumping station. Another village, thankful that the woman known as Auntie Yun is making a difference. <laughs> Trying to protect China's environment can be dangerous business. The government says it welcomes NGOs. We call them environmental protection groups in China. The activities of these NGOs are permitted by law. They have the support, encouragement and protection of the Chinese government. I think environmental protection is the area that is given the most freedom in China. We are open to the public, open to the environmental protection groups. We are also open to the international NGOs. Despite such assurances, several leading Chinese environmentalists have been locked up in jail. Industrialists, local governments, police, corrupt officials undermine the work of environmental protection. Ma Jun, a prominent green activist since 1999, a man who wrote the first major book on the destruction of China's rivers, believes only a low-profile, non-confrontational approach will work. China has a, uh, has a long history, and uh, through all the history, uh, China's ruled in a, in a top-down way. You know, it's, uh, uh, there's not much tradition for citizen uh, involvement in public governance. Uh, so I, I think you know, now in a, China is trying to build a modern society and, uh, and the government uh, has realized that it cannot just do everything. It can, cannot just manage everything by itself. It needs uh, non-governmental organizations to fill up some of the, fill up some of the gaps. Ma Jun, with just a few researchers in a small apartment, gathers data on 18,000 Chinese companies in violation of environmental laws. His research goes online into a list of shame to embarrass companies into going green. But he takes a gentle approach in pushing industry. In turn, the companies send in environmental compliance reports, verifying they are cleaning up their act, clearing their names. We should start with, uh, with something more modest. This is a way that uh, obviously is uh, less confrontational. You know, try to work with the company to solve the problem rather than simply you know, trying to uh, confront them. And while Ma Jun has had some success, many others have been met largely by failure. The fishing boats hang expectantly along the banks of the Chantang River, as they have for 30 years. For nearly that long, Xiao Guantong has come here each day. Xiao painstakingly lowers his boat into the water, prepares his nets. All before setting off for a day in which he used to catch as much as 60 pounds of fish, enough to sell and feed his family. But that was then, and this is now. A few years ago here, pollutants began to destroy the feeding grounds, so the fish have nothing to eat anymore. There's too much oil and pesticide in the water. Today, Xiao is likely to yield nearly nothing from the waters of the Chantang, and what he does catch is often not fit to eat. Waiting to help haul in the catch, or more often just haul in the boat, is Xiao's wife, Wei Dongying. 
The research that has been done shows there are more than 400 wastewater pipes depositing chemicals into the river, chemicals which are really hard to break down. Mrs. Wei is pretty well known around here. She's a tireless campaigner. Chinese newspapers have published articles about her. She has waged a relentless effort to clean up the waters. But she has had troubled fortunes and mixed results. Since 1992, Mrs. Wei's fishing village of Wu Li has become home to an expanding industrial park. Part of China's 600-mile eastern corridor of rapidly growing industry, employing millions, raising the incomes of people once dependent on farming and fishing, but at a cost which Wei Dongying was to discover. In 1998, Mrs. Wei began to suspect her own water well was polluted. She later became ill, as it turned out, only a benign tumor. After her recovery, Mrs. Wei began gathering water samples, certain that factories were dumping tons of waste into the river, which were not only poisoning the fish, but causing hundreds of people in Wu Li to fall ill. There are a lot of factories polluting the water. It's damaging our health. In 2002 here, our young people received physical fitness tests by the army, and none of them passed the test. Today, she displays quite a collection of bottles of polluted water. There are all colors of polluted water. This one looks like milk, but of course it's not. She sent some of her bottles off to the Environmental Protection Agency for testing. Acting on her tips, the state did shut down one factory, which made pesticides. In the village, people say because of Mrs. Wei, things have improved, but not enough. Wu Li is known as a cancer village. In the past seven years, in a town of fewer than 2,000, 72 people have died from various cancers. You can smell the chemicals from the factories. They're the reason so many people have got sick here. If things continue like this, everyone in the village will get cancer eventually. Mrs. Wei has kept a diary and a list of those afflicted. Despite her best efforts, the factories continue to violate the law to pollute, often at night. And so by stealth, flashlights and bottle in hand, Wei and her husband carefully climb down the river embankment to gather more samples. It has been a struggle for the couple in more than one way. They have been threatened by the factory workers in the plant next door to Wei's home. The workers fear environmental activism could cost them their jobs were their factory to be shut down. I went to challenge the chemical plant one night. They beat me up and dragged me away from the factory. Mrs. Wei does not want to push too hard anymore. She complains she has no protection, no political connections, little money, little power, little support. A one-person effort cannot work. I keep reporting the water is bad. The factories keep saying it is good. I am not a well-educated woman. I know little. What can a poor fisherman's wife do? Still, Mrs. Wei continues to campaign and test the waters. You'll no doubt find Wei Dong Ying and her husband hunched down over a bubbling cauldron of polluted water, gathering samples. Hoping their individual actions will somehow promote government action. If opposition to cleaning up China's rivers are complicated by uncaring industrialists and slow-to-act government, India, Asia's other great burgeoning nation, has those problems and something else, the complication of religion. First light over the river. Westerners call it the Ganges. In India, it is the holy Ganga. As they do every morning, throngs of the faithful are drawn to its waters. Here at Varanasi, far down its length, where the river has settled into a gentle meander, 
the banks attract the largest numbers of devotees. Consider the living embodiment of Hinduism. Millions come to worship. They come to wash themselves, to wash their clothes, to wash their animals. But all this intense activity often takes place right next to outlets discharging raw sewage. For with all her religious significance, the river also serves the more mundane function of carrying away the vast amounts of sewage and industrial waste generated by the cities located along its length. It also disposes of carcasses, both animal and human. And just downstream, the main sewage outfall turns the Brown River black. A film on the surface, bubbling methane beneath. And yet this is where a fisherman chooses to place his net, hoping to take advantage of the greater fish numbers drawn to the nutrients in the water. Even so, Subash says, it still takes him all day to get a catch worth taking home. The pollution of the Ganga has long been recognized by agencies both local and national as a pressing problem. But a solution has so far proved elusive. We have all possible technologies to take care of the river, but still the rivers of the world are not clean. And here there is an example that people have so much love and faith for the river, but faith and love alone cannot do the job. Dr. Vibe Mishra has campaigned for the past 25 years to clean up the Ganga. As a civil engineer and also a Hindu high priest, his approach to the problem has been a unique combination of science and faith. If I were only a scientist, I would just run away from her. And if I were only a committed and devoted person to Gangaji, I will fight with anybody who says that Ganga is polluted. But this is our strength, we combine both. To prove how polluted the Ganga has become, the organization he founded does regular testing along the river. Mishra Ji, as they call him, has been at this a long time. For 25 years, he's tried to do something about the deteriorating waters of the Holy River. We thought that we will work as a catalytic agent in the society going to all sections of the society, telling them, requesting them that please do something, please do something. And in the process, there will be a big chemical reaction will start and the river will be clean. That was our dream. But it was a dream unfulfilled. Mishra's passion for new ideas in pollution control have fallen on deaf ears within the Indian government. Instead, the government has spent hundreds of millions of dollars on conventional sewage treatment plants to little effect. Often the old systems installed fail because of lack of power to drive the pumps. In the 1990s, Mishra scoured the world in search of simple filtration systems based on the use of pond algae to help improve water quality. In a tropical climate like uh, India, mm -hmm. I think this is the best system. Mishra may not have had his way with Indian bureaucrats, but the plight of the Ganga has led to an increasingly vocal movement calling for a major rethink on how the country deals with the pollution of all its waterways. We cannot clean our rivers the way the Americans cleaned up the Hudson or the Germans cleaned up the Rhine or the, or the Brits cleaned up the Thames. And it is our our inability to understand that we don't have the money or the technology to be able to keep investing into treating sewage. So really a country like India, and I believe this is going to be a challenge for most of Africa, for most of us who will require to reinvent the way we do pollution control. It is too expensive, it is perhaps too ridiculous for us to be able to do it the way the rest of the world has done it. 
One of the approaches in Varanasi that could be would be to take this sewage downstream of Varanasi and to treat it perhaps on land at a low cost way and then reuse the sewage in agriculture. So essentially rethink sewage. Beyond the chronic waste in the Holy River, a new and pressing concern now preoccupies campaigners. The fundamental threat to the river posed by climate change. For as satellite images show, the glaciers that feed the Ganga, high up in the Himalayas, are suffering alarming rates of decline, a result of global warming. The broad estimate is that about 40% of the flows in our northern rivers comes out of glacier melt, which only means that we as a nation will have to become far, far, far more careful in the use of our water, which also means that we will have to use every drop of water as if it was our last. The prospect of the river shrinking by up to a half is an alarming one for a society that considers it its spiritual soul. At intervals along the river, especially at this place near the heart of Varanasi, the funeral pyres burn day and night. From near and far, families bring the bodies of deceased relatives for cremation. The holy Ganga must receive them. All of these acts of devotion inadvertently add to the pollution problems, but they confirm the river's indispensability in the psyche of the nation. And for literally millions of people who live along its banks, the river is the very source of life itself. It feeds a water table essential for agriculture. The village of Kotova, like so many others in this rich farming belt, relies upon the waters for its crops. Rice is one of the staples here. With four children to feed, Gauri Devi knows the river's importance. It's essential, she says. Everything comes from the river. At risk from climate change, at risk from the very people who worship here and rely upon it for their existence, the holy Ganga flows on. Mishra Ji and the campaigners who have proposed various low-tech, low-cost solutions have still gone unheeded. The pain and suffering which I have when I look at the river and when I go to her, I know that this could be helped, this situation can be solved. For Veer Bhadra Mishra, a man who has tried all his life to make a difference, it is now a matter of faith. If the destruction of Asia's great rivers is cause for alarm, the depletion of the Earth's rainforests may be a more immediate problem. By some reckonings, an acre of rainforest is being destroyed every second. In the lowland forests of Sumatra, there is a remarkable effort to reverse that statistic. It is called the Harapin Project, the Indonesian word for hope. And the hope is that this swath of rainforest will be protected and flourish. Occupying an area the size of Greater London, this lush tropical jungle provides some of the planet's richest biodiversity. But until now, it has suffered from extensive logging and encroachment by agriculture. Operating from a former logging camp at its edge, Muhammad Zubairan and his small team has begun the task of managing and protecting this precious resource, trying to make a difference. That's, that's the hope of this, this project. So we want to see the uh, rainforest as it was 100 years ago. Harapan and forest is the first of its kind in Indonesia and also in the world. And this project, Harap Harapan and forest, I think is really important. In trying to turn the clock back a hundred years, the project is looking forward a century. Overseas conservationists have joined forces with local groups to take on a 100-year license to manage the area. 
Adopting a strategy that combines conservation with no-nonsense policing, the project is yielding results. Where before the jungle used to buzz with the sound of chainsaws from illegal logging, today there is only the buzz of the jungle. There were probably up to about 600 chainsaws operating around the, around the forest. But as you can see now, well, there is still one or two, but, you know, not 600. I mean, it's a big drop. The end of tree cutting has also meant the return of the gibbon. Their strange whooping calls are all around, but they themselves remain out of sight in the treetops. Urup, a local tracker, knows these forests better than anyone else. For him, the return of the Gibbons' morning serenade is a good sign. In recent months, we have been hearing the Gibbons more and more. We didn't hear them before. But the Gibbons return at exactly the time they stopped the illegal logging. Although still richly wooded, former logging concessions have stripped a lot of this area. And everywhere in these woods are the signs of illegal logging. One of many trees felled but never dragged out by the logger who felled it. The depletion of the Sumatran rainforest is symptomatic of how this unique habitat has been exploited and degraded across Southeast Asia. Based in Singapore, Sean Lum is a rainforest expert who has witnessed the shocking decline. If you look at all the tropical forest regions, Africa, Amazonia, Southeast Asia, I think Southeast Asia has the smallest block of forest to begin with and broken up on, into these smaller land masses. On top of that, you have a, this is the largest and fastest growing in terms of human population. So there's a huge demand for the resources. We have in this region some of the world's most efficient timber companies, uh, largest pulp and paper companies, a long tradition of plantation agriculture, huge markets in North Asia that are willing to, you know, happily s devouring all the products from this area. So you've got all the ingredients that, that contribute to rapid deforestation. Fed by the alternating forces of tropical sunshine, followed by tropical rain, lowland rainforest should be the most abundant habitat on the earth. Operating from their camp, every day teams here are dispatched to safeguard that abundance. Their mission is twofold, deal with any illegal loggers they come across, and at the same time, record and monitor the health of the wildlife that exist here. In effect, they are policemen naturalists. The patrol team here are looking out for any illegal activity but they also conduct an ongoing survey of fauna and flora. Taking the deeply rutted logging roads that crisscross the forest, even these motorcycles struggle, and this is the dry season. First stop, deep in the jungle, one particular tree which is home to one of the forest's rarest birds, the hornbill. The bird that can only survive in rainforest has become the symbol of the Harapan Initiative. On this trip, no sign of the hornbill, but luckily for the bird, the loggers who had tried to cut down its home gave up halfway through. Urip shows the marks left by the whirring teeth of their saws. While wildlife in the Sumatran jungle are hard to see, evidence of their revival are clear. Footprints from a passing taper. And then further on, the forest's rarest inhabitant, numbering only 20, the Sumatran tiger. This is a footprint of Sumatran tiger. Mm, it's maybe one week ago. The details of each find are carefully logged with satellite accuracy. The tiger has not been found until recently in this part of the jungle. Again, another sign of forest life reasserting itself. It was very difficult was it, to see hornbills and the gibbons calling in the morning and the footprints of the tiger, Sumatran tiger. But now I'm happy to say that we, you can see there's a lot around. In protecting the wildlife, getting on board the forest human inhabitants is just as important. Home to indigenous people who lead a semi-nomadic existence. 
the Harrapin Project is careful to incorporate their needs. Gradually, they are winning hearts and minds, but it's not easy. At the camp, the door of the main office still bears the scar from a machete, the night a mob attacked it. Do know about the conservation effort that is going on here, and they understand. We go around to the villages, explaining why they need to respect the forest. With such valuable resources in such an economically impoverished place, the pressures on the forest are intense. They are set to become even more acute as the world demands a product common to the lowlands of Indonesia and Malaysia, palm oil. With rising demand, driven by food shortages and the need for biodiesel, plantations of oil palm have been rapidly spreading, encroaching on the forest from all sides. How do we plant oil palm without eating into the best remaining habitats, these sort of so-called high conservation value forests? And so I suppose it would be to identify these areas, these core areas that ought to be preserved, how to link them up together through habitat corridors instead of just kind of blanketing the landscape completely with palm oil plantations. We don't have big national parks by and large in Southeast Asia. If you look on the map, these are small, tiny reserves. Some of the world's most diverse tropical rainforests uh, as little islands in a sea of oil palm. By four-wheel drive, a journey to the heart of the rainforest and one of its least disturbed areas. This is rainforest at its most abundant and diverse. All of the forest used to look like this. Now this area counts for just 30%. It is what the whole of this jungle will eventually look like when it's restored. At least that is the Harapan, or the hope. So what will the forest look like 50 or 100 years from now? Good forest, nice forest, that people will come and see, will sit and see a real forest in 50 years, I guarantee. <laughs>
Oh, Professor Pan has come from so far away to protect our monkeys. We should do the same. One of his first tasks was trying to reduce the damage being done to the trees covering the slopes, damage from the villagers' demand for firewood. In this rural area with its heavy dependence upon the water buffalo, the answer seemed obvious. Utilize the plentiful supply of animal dung to provide biogas for cooking. In the Wei family household, the odious but necessary daily chore of feeding the biogas tanks with a mixture of manure, water, and straw. The result? A steady supply of gas to the kitchen stove. It has made a big difference to our routine. We no longer have to spend time collecting firewood. Reducing the amount of tree cutting for firewood had obvious and immediate benefits for the langurs. But as Professor Pan had hoped, the villagers, often wary of things new or unfamiliar, were brought round when they saw an obvious benefit for themselves. Without the need to gather firewood, production has nearly doubled. Professor Pan has extended his efforts to look after people as much as the langur, way beyond their sugarcane fields. He helps support a local school. These days, Pan affords himself the luxury of a car. Until recently, all his expeditions were mostly on foot. And on this day, he's off on a visit to a local hospital, also supported by his NGO. The hospital that he helped to establish is primitive by most standards, but in this part of rural China, it provides an essential service. Here, as elsewhere in this locality, Professor Pan is a familiar and respected figure. Everyone welcomes him wherever he goes, and even little children know him and will say, oh, Grandpa Pan is coming. Nearly 20 years into his mission, Professor Pan shows no sign of losing any of his zeal. But it's time to think about who will carry on his work. The center's regular film nights are as much a chance to look at succession planning as to reminisce. Professor Pan made his name from his work studying and protecting China's iconic giant panda. But it is his work with the Langur that may prove to be the cause for which he'll be best remembered. And a younger generation of environmentalists now work with him, taking up the cause. On the evening excursions into the hills, they take on the meticulous work of monitoring the local troops of monkeys. While increasingly at Professor Pan's side is his daughter, Pan Yue, who is now helping to develop the NGO her father founded. For Pan himself, these trips are still magical. We have to understand their social structure and habits. We know that there are about 200 species of trees here. The Langas feed on only 20 of these species. And as darkness falls and this community of Langers makes their way back to the caves and the sheer cliffs, the proof of Professor Pan's success is evident. Newly born baby Langers clinging to their mothers. This family there has only one male and 11 female, but this year they have seven or eight newborn babies. So we can expect that uh, the population, they have very great potential of growing. The end of another day for a unique monkey that has a unique environmentalist watching over them. In China, if environmentalism is to take hold, it will have to be adopted by the business elite who are driving the nation's remarkable economic expansion. Growth and green today are out of balance in China. One is banking on the power of the sun. He's a photovoltaic engineer turned billion dollar businessman, one of China's richest. Dr. Shi Zhongrong, 
enters the research and development section of China's biggest solar power company, the third largest maker of solar panels in the world. Dr. Shi devoting himself to several goals. One area is uh, uh, improves efficiency, as I said. A second area is a thin film. We have a thin film project. Actually, we are building a thin film manufacturing plant in Shanghai at this moment. And the third area is is working on balance on system, because a part of from the solar panels, there is some other electronic component and a mounting structure. So that part we want, also want to control the cost of that part. The science of solar energy is a work in progress. Here they make millions of fragile silicon wafers, photoelectric cells, which, when assembled, draw in light, converting that to electricity. At this lab, we'll try to improve the efficiency of this solar cell. Okay. The trick so now is to make these cells more power. sensitive, thin it. as film, Please. to make the power generating process more efficient and the electricity produced cheaper. We need to drive the cost down of solar panel as quickly as possible. Solar manufacturing costs will continue to drop down. Will be very soon lower than the electricity generated by coal, gas, and oil. Within seven years, Dr. Sher believes solar electricity will cost about 10 cents a kilowatt hour, cheaper than the alternatives. The growth of sun power equipment so far is phenomenal. A $20 billion business worldwide in 2006, by 2010, it'll be worth five times that. Here in China, growth at SunTech is even faster. The carefully kept teacups of the workers here. There were only a few hundred of them in 2001. Now there are nearly 5,000. Founded with a $6 million investment, SunTech has become a listed company worth more than $6 billion today. And it happened within five years. Clearly, Dr. Shi has faith in the future of solar power. Only solar, you know, is infinite supply. We believe, you know, uh, solar will be, uh, you know, one of the main energy supply in the, in, the, in the future, far ahead of wind and biomass and other renewable energies. Most of SunTech's production is for European or American energy projects. The biggest, this one in southeastern Spain, the world's largest solar farm producing enough electricity for 20,000 homes. But for all his success, Dr. Shi so far has found an uphill fight in his struggle to persuade the Chinese government to rely more on solar power. Here in China, support has been slow in coming. We have been trying to lobby the government all the time. Solar is more expensive. You know, we do need some subsidy or some uh, incentive you know, for it to be uh, economically viable. And, uh, but uh, in, like in Europe or in the U.S., government you know, provides a tax credit. Still, Dr. Shi believes it's all a matter of time and education. I always see myself, we are a pioneer, the people you know, working in the renewable energy uh, industry, and we know the urgency of the challenge the human being is facing this moment, okay? Global warming and climate change. And that is an urgency that Dr. Shi wants to impress on his workers. It's why every new employee here, trapped on the company bus to and from work, is asked to watch a film by a certain Nobel laureate named Al Gore. The teacher went on to become science advisor and current The purpose, you know, of asking on my staff to watch this movie, then led them to understand how important the job we are doing for the human society. Dr. Shi believes the first step in the Earth's salvation lies in education. And in Shanghai, one organization started by international conservationist Jane Goodall targets China's youngest citizens. Called Roots and Shoots, it's an initiative run by a dynamic 25-year-old named Zizi Zhong. Roots and Shoots is a program which we bring to the school. We set up an organic garden in the school, and the students, they take turns to go into the garden to take care of the vegetables. They turn the soil, they pick the worms. They love the organic garden program because this is something they have never done before. 
This is our first strawberry. These are children of the single child generation, so they probably don't do any housework at home. If you ask them where food comes from, they probably say, you know, from any supermarket in Shanghai. This back to nature program is being carried out in a city that has undergone an urban transformation unimaginable a few years ago. The gleaming facade of Pudong, the east side of Shanghai, was little more than a farming village 20 years ago. Well, Shanghai has certainly changed a lot. I can just walk in the street in a week's time and don't recognize any of the buildings. And this is my city. I, I grew up here. Shanghainese people, they're known for being very practical. They want to make things work. People want to change. People want to change for the better. There will be a time for people to transfer this vibrancy into environmentalism. It is a vibrancy among people that provides hope for all who are making a difference. This is the message actually we want to send to our students. You start today, you start with yourself. Then you tell your friends, you tell your parents, you tell your teachers to follow you. It's not difficult. I'm not saying that everybody we work with, every single student is going to be a environmentalist in the future. This, this is not necessary. We don't need that many environmentalists in this country or in this world. But once they have this sense of responsibility, when they grow up, then they will say, I want to do something that my children, my children's children, will not blame me for. I became more and more aware that in order to improve the environment, we would need everyone's efforts from the villagers all the way through to the government. We are pioneer the people in you know, working in the renewable energy uh, in the industry, and we know the urgency of the challenge the human being is facing this moment. We want to see the uh, rainforest as it was 100 years ago. This project, Harapan Air Force, I think is really important. This is a direct response to the global, you know, global climate change issue. People have so much love and faith for the river, but faith and love alone cannot do the job. There are things that NGOs do better than government and we can make the government realize our value and work with officials in their campaign.